what did this match cost overall to run? Well, let me, let me break it down a little bit. I have a couple of, let, let's do it a couple different. Cause I have okay. some, some more detailed questions than just what did it cost? Let's start with what was your overall cost that you actually spent on this match? Like out of, well, spent cash. And I don't want to get into a lot of numbers, but we spent $1 million. Welcome to the Tom Castro Shooting Academy podcast. You have now entered the next level. What's going on, guys? Welcome to another Next Level podcast. All right, guys, I have a special guest today. My really, really good friend, a gentleman that I've become even better friends with since this, since last year, Mr. Todd Holmes. I brought Todd on today for one reason and one reason only. I wanted to talk to him about the best match that I've been to this year which was the South Carolina sectional. It was the best match that I have shot in probably two or three years. So there's a couple of crazy things about this match that I felt like needed to kind of get out there. Obviously I'm really good friends with my man Todd here. So I know a lot of details about this match, but there's some questions I had that I didn't even ask him. So I want to ask him while we're here on the podcast. Plus I felt like it was a very interesting conversation. Every time I would talk to him about, all the prep and everything he had to do to get into this match. So let me go ahead and introduce my man, Todd Holmes. Todd, tell him who you are, brother. Hey, what's up? Um, Todd Holmes, been shooting USPSA probably for three years now. Um, I'm stuck in B-class trash right now, shooting carry optics. I'll get there to A-class. And going through Tom's classes has been a huge benefit there. But, I mean, it's a community around here that makes it better. And we're very blessed here in the upstate. I was able to take over Belt and Gun Club USPSA about two years ago. Um, we didn't have a spot for the section match at that point. And Lucky, our section coordinator, Lucky Gray, came to me and said, would you do it? And I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have like two matches under my belt by the time we, it was going to be two or three matches by the time the section would come around. And I was like, I'm not prepared for that. So. He's like, well, belt and host it. I'm like, yeah, we'll probably host it, but I can't run it by myself. So Lucky came back to me and me, him, and David Lyle got together and some others and put on the first match. And then that was with the anticipation that after they helped me with it, that I'd take over the second year and ran it. So that was 2021, 2022. I took it over. Lucky um, helped out getting staff and then. Linda and a bunch of others, if you've been watching my posts on the Facebook page and everything, you see how important staff and your core people are to you. And then I took that over for 2022, and I don't know why, but I decided to take it um, on again for 2023. So we'll go over all that. It's a lot of work, but at the end of it, at the end of the match, once everything's put up, everybody's thanking you, everything that's going on, you're seeing what it was good what an awesome match it was. You're reviewing what do you want to do different for the next year? What didn't you do well? And you're moving on. And it's been great. We're already getting stage submissions for next year. The date's already been approved. It's going to be March 25th and 26th next year. So it's going to be an awesome match there. We're going to have some awesome sponsors back. And I'm just looking forward to doing this again, at least for the third year. So uh, let's start off with that, actually, because I wanted to give a shout out to Lucky from last year, man. That was the first time I came to your guys' area and shot that match. And I honestly don't remember why that match popped up. Uh, it was interesting because I've never even thought about going to South Carolina before for the match. And then I guess I still don't know why we ended up going to it. I think we had like four or five guys that we went with last year, and it was a great match. I mean, we had such a great time that I was like, all right, this is one of those matches that's on the list, right, from now on. And I, we didn't even know each other really at the time. No. And so the so I met Lucky, and, you know, I didn't really know a lot of guys in South Carolina. I know a few because I, I had a buddy, actually, I know why. Sam Caldwell moved up there, and that's we ended up going up there, staying at his place, and then and then shooting the match. So it was it was really cool that, like we were able to like kind of find another home, right? Like for me, mm -hmm. it feels like it just feels like I'm still in Florida when I'm there. All the guys there are super cool. There's a group of core guys that I just love being around and hang out, I get to be myself and, and have a good time. And like, I'm always afraid we're all getting kicked out of the restaurant and it's not always my fault. So that's good. That's finally a good thing. 
<laughs> okay, preacher boy. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh man, we might have to tell that story. <laughs> but um, so we're you know again, I it's like you guys have a a great community of shooters there. I think that's probably the number one thing that I enjoy about coming there. It's like man, everybody's so friendly and so nice, and I know that's some of the that Southern charm that, you know, you get, but you don't always go to Southern States and feel that that way, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, so I want to start off this actually with staff because for anybody who didn't go to South Carolina uh, sectional last year or this year, it's staff reset. So with staff reset, I guess the biggest question that I've always had is how the hell do you get everybody to help you? Cause I'm, it's a massive undertaking of help at that match. I mean, there is a lot of people. I mean, I, there was stages that you had four or five people deep on mm-hmm. each stage. So that is massive amount of, of people. How do you start that process? Cause it doesn't just, you don't just like one week go, Hey, everybody want to come do this match. I mean, it takes months. I'm assuming to get everybody right. Oh yeah. It, it definitely does. And I'll answer for lucky and Linda on this one. Lucky Gray and Linda Chico. They, have stepped up in the last lucky really did it for the 2021 and then lucky and Linda partnered and did it for 2022, but they really stepped up and it's talking at your local matches, doing your Facebook, your Instagram post. Um, when you're just talking about it in general, Hey, you want to come back and work or do you want to help out and work? It's, it's not anything that happens overnight. And it's, I think we had like 70 staff, um both years somewhere 60 to 70 staff that showed up between that's insane yeah just between your registration between the people working the stages your mr fix it your um the quartermaster and all that that it takes to put on that match your range master everything that it takes to put on the match it's crazy to think that there's 60 to 70 people out there working at any one time to get 80 shooters through and that's a match in itself. Like you, that's oh, like yeah. a whole nother organization that you have to have. Like you have to be completely organized on just that alone. That's 70 or 80 people that count for scores, count yeah. for food, count for attendance. I mean, count for everything, right? Like yeah. that's insane. That, that's yeah, really, really crazy. 70 or 80 people for that is, is really, really a crazy number. Yeah. 60 to 70. And then, yeah, it's just, it's insane when you think about it. And, you're going to have some dropouts, which is natural family emergencies come up and stuff. So I always try to go over a little bit and we did, and it was good that we did because some of the stages, I think we could have looking back on it, we could have put a couple more on some of the higher activator stages, make them run a little bit better and let that squad rest a little bit more. For instance, like stage 10, where we had the four bobbers and the, I think two pieces of steel and then the two reset things. Yeah, the two targets USA um, reset right pads, which all of that was a heavy reset. I think we had four or five people there. Probably could have done with another one there. Yeah. So when you um when you set your staff up, do you? Because I, I one thing I always yell at you about is that you don't delegate enough. You do a lot of your <laughs> work yourself. So it was good to hear that you actually allowed other people to do things already in our first conversation here. Yeah. Uh, I'm always on your ass about always trying to do everything on your own because you don't want to inconvenience anybody, but that's, you're not inconveniencing when they're helping you. I know you don't know that, but. <laughs> Why not? Linda, Linda told me the same thing during the match too, yeah. so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but when you, um, so for your, for that scenario, do you have specific ideas of, because you know your staff pretty well, Lucky, obviously yes. you and Lucky are good friends. You guys can ha- have a good conversation and be like, look, this is what these guys are good at. I'm going to put these guys on this because they're faster, you know, younger, whatever it is. Like, if you know, there's a like great example is lucky work stage one. And that stage had a 50 yard, you know, run up, up the whole stage. So you, yeah. you, you couldn't put someone that wasn't going to be able to make that run. Every, you know, obviously having five, six guys or whatever that helps and they can rotate, but you have to be able to put somebody on there that can actually run that stage. So do you, did you guys sit down and be like, Hey man, I think this is the crew that we should put together for this stage. And this is the crew. Or did you kind of just, they figured it out as they went. It, it took a lot of that lucky and Linda, I'll say real did that a lot. Linda got the staff list together. Lucky took a look at it. Lucky, as you said, stage one was the biggest one. Love it or hate it was my stage. And lucky said, Hey, I'm taking the hardest stage. Yeah. So lucky took on that stage. He took the group of guys that wanted to work with him and said, you want to work with me? You're, we're working the hardest stage, and here's why. Yeah. And he definitely took that one. There were some retreat stages that we wanted to make sure we had 
some younger people that could actually back up and not trip over themselves. So there's definitely considerations that go into all that. Um, stage seven, I think we staffed up a little bit more because we had the holy monkey and it had the four pieces of steel on it too. So did feel, definitely. Did you feel like that stage uh, ever got behind because of stage the, seven? The yeah. No. I, I, when I was there and, and it was, it ran so flawlessly. Like, I don't yeah. think that, I don't think honestly the entire match, I don't remember at one, at any point in the entire match going, Oh man, these guys are really slow or, and that is a huge compliment to you and your staff because you could screw that up really quickly when you have a half day format. Right. Well, yeah. Like <laughs> Saturday afternoon, I think the heat got to everybody a little bit and we ran everybody through and I'll admit I was concerned Saturday afternoon with the turnaround times that we were doing, but we got through it. So, and then Sunday morning, the staff kicked ass because that was not there Sunday morning. And I was like, okay, it was a hiccup because I was talking to Mike Adams, the RM. I was talking to Bill Dude and some other people during Saturday afternoon going, okay, why is this going so slow? Some people that had been around more than me and trying to get their feedback. And I think we might have back on a few activators and a, few things here and there we had i loved it but it was also kind of a detriment we had basically 10 long courses yes you did. and <laughs> the, yeah the max round count for the match could have been 320 we were at 294 so and i'm gonna tell you nationals barely gets to 300 rounds on your yeah. average so the fact that and that's why and i don't think that a, a a great match comes from high round count i think a great match comes from the stage designs I honestly don't even care about all the other side shit that goes with a match that everybody complains about. I don't care about porta potties. I don't, I mean, I, I, yeah. none of that stuff bothers me. I want great stages and great match, uh, like great match wise. So, and you provided that like in a hundred fold, like that was one of the best matches I have shot because that you could run those stages four or five different. I, mm -hmm. and, I and I complained to you and I don't want to say complain because I didn't, but I, <laughs> I, I told you there was one stage. I said, there was only one stage that I felt like had no stage plans. Like it was one stage plan. Everybody, well, anybody who had a, an idea of how to run a good <laughs> stage was going to run it that way. And it was like, all right, look, we're all going to run. But when you have nine out of 10 stages that are absolute, just crushing it, I'm like, bro, you did an amazing job. And, and sometimes those stages aren't, you're not running like a completely different plan. Sometimes it's just the way you attack targets changes an entire stage right so now instead of running to a corner and shooting everything could i have shot it from on the move could i have shot the targets to the right uh and then move to the left or or any of those different things that's where you really see the difference in those stage plans uh or in those stage designs and that's what i loved about that match you there were so many great things about that match but when the stages are what i'm talking about to me that's a just an amazing match yeah, and it was, and that took, we had five different stage designers for this match, and see if I can name them all off, Brian Flowers, um, Aaron English, Aaron Banks, Rob Ravina, and myself, and Tyler Messenheimer was on the stage committee also, and we, they all submitted numerous stages, and we checked the egos at the door when we had two or three different meetings and said, let's pick the best 10, and I think we did that, and then asked the stage designers to check their ego a couple more times on it because I changed some stuff on their stages. <laughs> so, so I'm like, why, okay, why I want to change and why. Um, so stage three, um, I put in the drop turner, the four shot drop turner because that I loved it at Georgia. Stupid. That was stupid. Nah, I, I love like, that. <laughs> that was a great stage, dude. I love that. I thought that that's, I'm telling you, that was one of my favorites. I mean, I made three videos about that. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so I made three videos about the same damn stage. That's how good I thought that stage was. Just, just there was so many different ways to do things on those match in this match. I loved it. Yeah, and you can thank Randy at um, Georgia last year where he had the clamshell there. Yeah, he and did. he did that. And I was like, okay, this was when I was walking stages and everything at Georgia. I'm like, okay, there. Everybody was stopped at that stage, examining yeah. it. There's 15 different conversations on that. Hell, some guys like me that concentrate so much on that ran past the target on that stage. <laughs> yes, it will. It happens, man. It's what they do it for. Yep. So it was, I wanted to take something like that and find a way to incorporate that into this match. And that stage and that prop was just an excellent place to do it. Not everybody liked it, but I felt it added a lot to it. And people 
talked about it. They shot it different ways. I sat there and watched that in one spot be shot three different ways. So what, what is it, what was the complaint about that specific stage or that com- the specific target in general? It, the, the detriment, the only things that I really heard bad about it was that it's four shots. Nobody's going to do it and stuff like that. And I was like, that's not why I'm doing it guys. I'm doing this. So it is a conversation. You're going to see five or six different stage plans on this. You're going to see people. I think you even skipped it that totally skipped it. And like, I think in the video, you Christian and gosh, I can't remember the Casey. No, was it no, the third me, guy? Me, me, Mike and uh, me, Mike and um, Christian. Oh my gosh. No, no. Oh my gosh. Why can't I um, Tilly, Chris Tilly. Yeah. Yeah. Us three. Yeah. It was me, Mike Wang and Chris Tilly. Yep. You all shot it three different ways and you're all ways. pro Completely level shooters yeah. shot it three <laughs> different ways. And within what, if I remember like a hit factor or, Less than a hit factor of each of you on that. So I was I was three points behind. That was it. Three points. It was, and I skipped it completely. And, and the difference between mine and his were my hits. I had uh, uh, the the extra Charlies, but I had to try really hard. <laughs> he didn't right. Like he he tried yeah. hard, but I mean I really had to have an excellent run to to make up for basically twenty points. Right. That mm-hmm. was a lot of points to make up. So I learned a lot on that stage after the match and have learned some things about skipping targets. Like I still believe that my plan was the best because I lost by three points. So that shows me there's some accuracy stuff there that I could have cleaned up. I mean, I didn't feel good at the match, but regardless, Mike crushed it. And that's all that matters. Like, so now I can look back and go, all right, cool. Like I trusted my abilities and I lost by three points. I'll take that all day long. Right. Not 30 points, guys. I lost by three points. Mm-hmm. So if I lose a stage by three points and I trusted my stage plan, I- I'm more than willing to lose a match because I did what I, I trusted myself to do. I- you know, believe in yourself and you'll see a big difference in your shooting. Trying to follow somebody else's stage plan is not going to get you a win. I promise it- it- you have to believe in your shooting and trust the way you've been taught how to shoot. And that's that's what changes the difference. But that stage alone, it was really awesome because TJ was on that stage. And uh, we had a very long conversation about whether I should take it or not take it and all that (laughs) stuff. And I was like, dude, I'm not taking it. He goes, I don't know, man. He's like, I don't know. He's like, cause obviously he RO'd that stage. So he'd seen it all. Right. But he couldn't tell me what he saw. (laughs) He couldn't tell me what he saw because he was the RO. So I, I, I was like, I was like, he, so I don't even remember if we even talked about, I think he just asked me like, what are you doing here? And I was like, I'm skipping it. He goes, okay, like, you know, like, all right. Are you sure? Well, listen, I've coached him a lot and and he's a really good friend. So like we've had open conversations about these type of targets on other matches. Like, like before I got to that stage, I remember you came up to me and said, you're skipping it, aren't you? (laughs) I was like, damn, dude, you know me too well. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, yeah, I'm skipping it. And and, because you know my reason, the reason I skipped it is because I had to wait for it. Yep. Right. I had to wait for it, but same reason you skipped it at Georgia. I already knew you were going to, but I just wanted to put it there. It's funny though. Cause I talked to a lot of guys. Uh, I talked to a lot of guys about that stage and a lot of people looked at that stage and thought that the max trap was the key to that stage. And it wasn't the key to that stage is what do you think the key to that? St- I don't know. I might've told you already. What do you think the key to that stage was in Georgia? No, the one, no, that's out the South Carolina stage. The one we're talking that about. That was the drop turner and the swinger. Yep. What do no you think trap. was the key? Oh, I'm sorry. Drop turn. I, I keep calling it max. <laughs> what do you think the key was on that stage? Everyone thinks it's the drop turner. The drop turner is not it. I think it was getting in and out of the low port. It's the swinger. The swinger. Oh, because you could catch that from two yes. different spots. If, but if you had to wait on the swinger, that's what cost you the win. So yep. the reason Tilly lost that stage or, or was a little bit behind, he had to wait on the swinger. Mike didn't have to wait on the swinger at all. He hit that spot in that back right corner, and, I mean, it was just perfect timing. But, again, you can't really predict it. You you just have to get back there, and it's there if it's not there. So you weren't able to predict it. The way I ran it, I ran it a little bit short so I could control the swinger. Mm-hmm. So either way, either no matter how I entered that position, I was going to have the swinger available. So that was the crazy part is he, he – he was just fortunate enough to have the swinger there. And that's what actually gave him the three point win, which dude, not only that, I mean, he's, he's freaking amazing, but that little, that little bonus is what gave him the win. Right. Just think about if he's just a half a second slower, I win. 
that stage yeah. and don't even shoot it. So it's just those little things that you don't see when you're walking the stage. If you don't pay attention to that could really cost you the stage win, what, no matter how good you shot it. Right. Cause now this, the swinger controls you instead of vice versa. So, but I, yeah, great, great freaking design, bro. That, that was a great design. And that staff reset in that section was a, those guys were hauling ass through there. I mean, they had an army of you go to the pad, you go to the right get mm-hmm. the swinger, you set up this, you do this, you do that. I mean, it was, it was a very fine, well-oiled machine that you guys had going yeah. at for and all I think, stages. And I think I mentioned it in the post today. I think that was the stage that came up to me and said, Hey, you shot this in 26 seconds. I'm like, okay. And they're like, we're resetting it quicker than you shot. I'm like, all right, I got to shoot this stage quicker next year. But it was a challenge to them. Yeah. So yeah. that that was awesome that we had to cruise out there like that. And I know more than one stage did that, but that I think they started it. Yeah, they did awesome, dude. I'm telling you, it was, uh, they did an amazing job. Like just all of them, the entire staff. I, I don't think there was a single staff member that I didn't see that was just a team. Like everybody was a team. And yep. that's something you don't always see. You know, sometimes you see the guy who just kind of hangs out in the chair the whole time. But, you know, I, I walked around that match a lot and paid a lot of attention to those things. Just uh, it's interesting because, it, you know, you've motivated me and and Area 6 is motivated in general. Obviously, I'm in Area 6 with Florida, but we somehow aren't. We don't act like Area 6. <laughs> but I'm going to try to put a match on this year in November, and I'm going to try to do staff reset. I, I think it's time to set the tone right for, yeah. for here. So that's, that's kind of my goal is I, I feel like it's not going to be a huge match. It'll be 10 stages. Uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of bays, but we're, we're going to do something interesting. I'm going to bring back the party. I'm going to bring back a uh, dinner on Saturdays and dinner on Sundays. I want to start having, I want to bring the group, the family back, right? Like the one thing yeah. I miss the most from shooting is the award ceremonies and not because of trophies, but because you get to sit, sit down, shoot the shit with people that are actually friends that you don't get to shoot with all the time. There's a lot of people that you can't put on your squad when you're shooting. So you don't get to see them until, you know, you're passing by or, or whatever. So it's, it's something that I feel like we've lost. And I think, I think we've lost it a lot in this sport since COVID, man, we haven't brought it back. Like that. And I mean, I hate to say everything comes down to, but the expense of it, yeah, but we got to, the, the expense needs to, the mindset needs to change. So like for, for me, for my match, the way I'm looking at it, and actually that's one of the things we're going to be talking about later on in, uh, after we get off this podcast another day is I'm going to pick your brain about a lot of this stuff, but my goal is to, is to not pay for lunch and let people pay for their own lunch. I'll bring lunch in and they can just pay for it yep. ahead of time, but I'm going to pay for dinners instead. And instead of paying for lunch. So that way I can take that expense from now, obviously staff I'll take care of. That's different. But for dinner, I want to pay for a nice day. I do. I want to bring a DJ in. I want to have a fun ass time. I mean, I want this to go back to what it used to be when I started. I mean, we used to hang out afterwards. The best time that I've ever had in a match is when we go out to eat after we shoot. Oh yeah. Right. Like shooting is what brings us together, but like real shit happens at dinner when you're all shooting the shit, talking trash to each other, telling you how much you suck. Cause your, your guys are resetting faster than you shoot. You know what I mean? Like that's the kind of stuff. Yeah. You, that's the kind of stuff you want to get together for. Right. Yep. And I had some conversations with some people along those lines and in the past, and I don't know if I'll be able to do it for next year, but they got sponsors for like the, like they got a sponsor for the staff meal. They got a sponsor for, like the award ceremony or Saturday evening meal and stuff like that, that I'm going to try. I can't promise it, but it's those things that, okay, I didn't even think about different items like that and stuff that I just hadn't been exposed to. So, yeah, well, and that, and that's the best part, honestly, about you from what the time that we've talked about this match, because we haven't really talked about it until after the match was over, but you, you have are really open to new ideas and trying to improve at all times. Right. So I, I, that's one of the questions I actually had for you is what is one of the things that you would have, or what is the biggest things to you that really stuck out in your mind that you want to change from this year to, to the next year? What, what is something that like, you didn't like, you're like, man, there's just a few things that really stuck out in your head. You're like, I didn't see that coming. Or what's a couple of things that you probably got that blindsided you? Because I'm sure there's a few. Um, we've been really fortunate in the past with having good food trucks at the club. And we had a great barbecue one that I used for, I put on an Outlaws Falling Steel match. And I 
and put on the USPSA match. They were tied up with his niece's wedding, so they weren't able to do it. So I just went on Greenville Food Trucks and selected a food truck. They had a good menu. They had Mexican. They had um, corn dogs, french fries, and hamburgers. I'm like, okay, going to be awesome. One thing I will do in the future, thank God I got my other food truck back, but if I had to, had to do it again, I would make sure I vetted them a little bit more and paid attention to their ticket times. Because on Friday for staff day, there were probably 30 to 45 minute average ticket times. So some of the staff had almost a two hour break while they were waiting for their food before they could start up their next stage. Um, how I adjusted that after listening to the staff complain, rightfully so on that, and a few phone calls, I woke up that Saturday morning and said, okay, what time's Chick-fil-A open? They opened up at 6.30, called them at 6, set my alarm. Whatever I was doing at 6.30 that morning, I stopped over at the shotgun clubhouse on a golf cart, I remember. Called them up. They saved the day, got 60 um, lunches for that. So I gave the staff then a choice. Do you want a Chick-fil-A box lunch or do you want Mexican? And then um, we also adjusted that Linda and I came up with the idea together. Instead of staff coming in for the meals, we got their menu orders ahead of time. And then we had the um, Edward Anderson and David Hartley who were helping out in registration. They got the menus to the food truck and they took the food out to them. So that made a huge difference. Without those adjustments on Saturday, there's no way we would have made it through. So I think that's a big thing right there, though, man, just just the fact that you were thinking on your feet and it wasn't just a, oh, well, this is what we've been dealt with. You found an answer. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love how you you're a leader. Right. Because you're I mean, you suck at delegating because you want to do it. You don't want to. <laughs> I, I still yell at you about that part. But it's awesome. The fact that you were like, well, I need to finish this match. How do I find an answer? There's no bitching and complaining. There's no. Oh, poor me. Oh, this food truck sucks. Just get find an answer and move to the next thing. I think that's something that we don't see a lot in this sport. You just see a lot of people bitching and moaning about everything instead of trying to, to fix it. So right now, the other thing that I love is that you're aware of what the problem is, right? Like obviously the food truck, you can't, you don't own yeah, the there, food truck. So you got your, you, whatever there it is, but is there any specific reason you think they were slow? Were they trying to take care of paying customers plus the people you've already paid for with the, the, the staff? Dude, or? And this is me being very fortunate with the food truck we've had in the past. They could do staff. They could do shooters. They could do everything at once. Yeah. And I figured Friday's a short day. It's not going to be any big issues. They didn't have the staff, and they weren't in expecting the influx of the volume at the time. Uh, so one of the things they did is they got more staff on Saturday and Sunday. But I also augmented the food on Saturday, not Sunday, because we weren't on the huge time crunch that we were. But yeah. so for Saturday for that. but it. I mean, it was a two-way communication thing. Could I have worn them, maybe prepared them better? I Probably. Yeah. But, and also, nobody expects a 30-minute ticket time. No, there's no there's no reason for a 30-minute ticket time out of when you're making tacos. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Or or even a hamburger. It, it, yeah. At the most, it's 10 minutes, even if you're making it fresh. It, it doesn't take yeah. long. Fries don't take long to put in the, I mean, I think fries take five to seven minutes of even. And that's yeah, if you're, if you're making fresh so. every time, right? So, you know, that that kind of, yeah, you can't really have that. But, um, uh, all right, next question for you is, and this is kind of different because I don't usually do the question thing. I usually just talk and, and have a thing, but I have a, a list here of things that I really wanted to bring up. How much research did you do for this match for the date that you put it on? Um, 2021 and 2022, we really kind of did the same thing. It's Lucky said, we've always had it springtime. I'm like, okay, let's go with that. Let's take a look at the dates. I think both years we did it on the fifth weekend of the month because there's not a lot. Everybody schedules your matches because there's four weekends in every month. Fifth weekend is usually open for something special, be it whatever it's going to be. So I was like, nobody's going to have anything against their locals or stuff like that. So let's do it on the fifth weekend in April. So that's what we did it um, both years on it for that. It's changed a little bit because I think Area 6 said, hey, we don't want it to be as cold in 23. And we don't. And so they went and took that date. And that's why we moved back to March. So we're going to be ahead of Area 6. We're going to be the warm-up match for Area 6 then in 2023. That's cool. So, 
That's a, I and I did that. research on that date too. I can't promise it, but it was 60s to 80s. The last three years on that weekend <laughs> i looked at the weather, historical right? stuff yeah you never can promise it though yeah you can't control weather like you know that there's just nothing you can do about that that's just part of it i mean area six this year was freezing ass cold and the year before wasn't freezing ass cold so it's just yeah like, you just you don't know like last year i think area six was pretty damn hot so I, and honestly i don't even look at the dates i look at what i want to go to and go to those dates. I don't have anything where I'm like, oh, uh, I'm definitely saving March or April because that's when Aries. I don't even think of that. I, I, but I'm fortunate. I don't have to have my schedule at the beginning of the year like some people. Like yeah. everybody knows Craig McElhaney, the guy that I, I, I'm really great friends with that I bring on here all the time. He has to give his vacation at the beginning of the year. Oh, all of it. Now, he can move some things around, but he kind of has to say, hey, this is what I'm thinking, you know, and uh, be close because, you know, he, then it, it becomes a hassle. He's got to trade with people. Yep. And that doesn't always work because then they have their same schedule trying to figure out their vacation days and, and all that stuff. So, yeah, I'll map it's mine out, but it doesn't have to be locked in stone. That would suck. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky that I can do whatever the hell I want. So if I don't work, I don't make money, though. That's the bad part. So, like, that yep. sucks, too. So, like, I don't get a paid. Your wife gets on you. <laughs> yeah, I don't get paid to not go to work. So that sucks. Um, all right. So the, the next one I had for you was uh, I think I asked you already how you took over as match director or you already told everybody about that. Yeah. How long did it take you to plan out this match? Um, Not 2023, because I already know that answer, and I'm going to have you answer that. Yeah. How long did it take for 2022 to put that match together? 2022 probably took six solid months. 2021 took six solid months because we really worked on it. I worked on 2022 a little bit more ahead of that, but with – the outlaw match I put on, I'm putting on a major quote unquote match every six months. Right. So it's, I really stepped away from it this year. I was, there's a few people that saw me really have an anxiety attack Sunday morning because <laughs> it's just everything that was going on. Not and I did that a little bit in 21 also, but this year I'm like, okay, I've got to get it started way earlier. So right now I've got the guys designing the stages. Yeah. So I let them know that I want all the stage designs in by like July 1st. I'll review them and then we'll have some more Zoom meetings and go over them and pick the best ones for them. And one of the things we did that I think would be better for that, and it was one of, I think it was Rob suggesting, instead of having a bunch of bays, uh, stages just thrown out and trying to fix the bay, sign bays to people. Yeah. So that's what we're doing this year. So they know the dimensions. So, and then we pick their best four or five or whatever out of however many they submit. So it's a process. It's then you've got, I've went through it all, but then you've got the stage design, then you got the inventory, then you got your match prep. You've got to get staff in through all of that. And then you've got to make sure you've got set up crew. One of the things we did different this year, instead of setting up on two days, we set up on four days and there was not the same setup crew in the whole time. Like it was the first year, but people came in and out and it worked out well. We could have done a few things different, but for the most part, it was much, well, it was much better. And I wasn't put in 13, four hour day, 14 hour days, like Lucky Dave and I did the first year. So, so how do you schedule that? I mean, since we got into that subject, that's a great subject. How, how do you schedule? Like, so you guys are for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Todd's from obviously South Carolina, his club is the Belton gun club. And this range has, how many competition bays do you have? Six. So they have six dedicated, <coughs> who else can shoot on, but the special people, competition oh, base. <laughs> <The> <laughs> That's not start this. <laughs> <laughs> they got six competition bays that are not used for anything but IDPA, USPSA, and Cowboy use them too? Cowboys and Steel Challenge. Okay, so Cowboys and Steel Challenge. So, so basically it's only competition like what we kind of do, the practical shooting area. Then... They have, uh, what is it, th four bays up top or five yeah. bays? Four, four bays? Well, there's five bays up top, but we use four of them. Usually four. Okay, so then they have four bays outside of that that are kind of like the public range slash – uh, it's only members only, but it's kind of like where everybody else goes and shoots. Even USPSA guys go up there who don't have access to the, to the down, down – um, the competition base, yep. but they can go up there and shoot, move around, do what they do. So it's really kind of interesting how those you're very fortunate to be able to shut down those six bays. Obviously you guys have to work with those other groups, but those six bays and be able to put everything up early. So how long does it take you to kind of set up those six bays or how long or how early do you start? I should say. 
this year we started um, on Sunday. And what we did is we made sure the six competition bays were clear. Everything was done in that. And then I'll go through and do an equipment list for what do I need for each bay. So on Sunday, what we did is we went through and laid out all the competition bays, threw all the equipment out in each bay. So when we got to that bay, we knew everything, well, 99, 95% of what you needed was already there. You're always going to forget something. So that was already there. And then we started putting up um, some bays. I think we got one and a half, maybe two done after we got everything done on Sunday, got everything laid out. And then on Monday, we were able to set up the, I think we got to the rest of the four and we pretty much had the competition bays um, set up at the end of Monday. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, we put up two stages each day and we did that. And on Tuesday, we put up the two lesser used of the member bays. And then we put up the more popular ones that we knew we were taking over the 100 yard and the steel bay on Tuesday, no, on Wednesday, we put those up. And then there's always four bays around the back that are available for the public, even when we knock those off. So they've got those, but we put all those up. And for those of you thinking that have been on setup crews, oh, I put up, you put up two bays in a day. Well, we have to make sure that we ran into this the first year and we didn't realize how bad wind coming through and all this unforeseen stuff does. So for the section we're putting up, we're securing the walls together every place that they touch with zip ties. We're making sure that each wall has a support stick on it, screwed into it and nailed in and making sure that literally if somebody falls on that wall, it's not going to break. So it's a lot of work putting in everything to make sure that it can stay up for two weeks. And some of the bays did when you came back, there's one bay, actually two bays that were up for, uh, I think like 10 days. Yeah, I know. We had the enjoyable time of taking it down. It was so much fun when you had to have power tools, jackhammers, <laughs> and crowbars that are eight feet long to pry everything out. So uh, I, I want to add to that because I've been to Belton. Tw- well, I've been to Belton a couple times now, but I've been there for two classes. I actually did year number two this year. Um, yeah. And I actually was there right after. It's so funny because I did the 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 match. And then the weekend after I came back and, and did a class there. And we were able to shoot two of the stages, which weren't even really the stages that I thought were the, they weren't even the best for what I wanted, but they were the two that were the best for a class, right? Mm-hmm. Those stages ended up being freaking awesome for the class. Like I was like, this is a lot better than I thought they would be. Cause I, the, the, I knew what I was going to teach on those but it wasn't a, a design that I made. It was just a design that was there. So I was like, there was a, one of the stages, I think it was staged. Uh, th- oh my gosh. We had four. two and four. Which one? The barrel. Okay. Four. That stage had a lot of running on it. And I try not to have like a bunch of running that doesn't have to do with shooting. Right. But I, I actually enjoyed that stage a lot in the class because it taught people that to shoot sooner, not faster, right? Don't run to a spot. And that stage, because it had so much running in the first, actually three positions, because you had to leave a barrel, enter, exit, enter again, exit, then enter Mm -hmm. again at full speed at hundred miles an hour, and then come in and start shooting at targets. So it was like really cool because that stage, and I'm probably going to end up adding something like that into my, my class, maybe not that specific stage, but that stage was pretty damn awesome because there were so many little things to work on in that stage, but tearing that stage apart was a mother effort. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why that these guys at Belton, especially the build crew, not just the teardown crew, but the, the, the build crew, their ground there is, uh, is it like pea gravel? It's not pea gravel. What is it? Number, what's the rock size? Do you I know? don't know what size it is, so but it's, it's a, gravel it's a, that's like three or four inches thick. Right. It's a small gravel, small rock. So it's not the best thing to run in. I, I'm not a huge fan of the cover there, the ground cover. But man, when they put a wall in, you dig six inches deep to get to the clay. Yep. And then... When you nail it in, you cover that some bitch by six inches of rocks. So when you go to take stuff out, you have to like literally dig to the other side of the planet to get to everything. So it's a huge undertaking to build there. It's not something where you just slap it out there on the ground and drive a nail in. Because if you do that, which 
you obviously have learned it all falls over with the wind because the the gravel isn't going to hold the the actual wall up with with heavy wind. Yep. You guys went as far, and I yelled at you about. I don't want to say yell, but I, I complained to you about this that you did overdid this. But you guys even screwed in the damn target sticks into the stands, yep. and I'm like, dude, you didn't need to do that. You're like, That's, yeah, what if it moves? And I'm like, it's not going to move. It's com- competitive equity. That yeah. wind isn't going to move that target. Yeah, it's not. Whatever, get out of here. It's it's gonna be <laughs> shut up. So it's just, but that's. I mean, that is some of the stuff that another thing, a big compliment and, and it sucks as a shooter because you can't really call the shot, but it is very, very nice for the RO. You guys wrapped your barrels in a Saran wrap. Not mm-hmm. only does it look better because <laughs> now you don't have these big, ugly ass blue barrels running around, but when you Saran wrap it, you know, whether they've shot through it or not. And that's yep. something that is really, really cool because when the, but again, as a shooter, it's not that much fun, but you shouldn't be shooting a barrel anyway. That's kind of what I, the way I look yeah. at it. But one I really of the think things, that's cool. One of the things we'll probably do a little bit different on that is the barrels that we know are going to be impacted is get a clean barrel there and paint it. Yeah. Because this frame wrap has its pluses and its minuses when you come to that. So yeah. we'll frame wrap everything that won't be an impact zone and the impact zone ones will probably paint them. So yeah. Painting that's to paint them and that's why they're wrapped. So, but yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there's ways to paint those that if you get like a paint sprayer, it's easier and you don't go with the spray cans like most people do and, and then yeah. paint the whole barrel black. Like when oh, you yeah, it will be. yeah, everything gets painted because then you don't have to have it turned a certain way. I, I, that's one thing I notice a lot is they keep the blue barrel and they only paint like a section. Well, oh, I hate, yeah, I hate that. And I got that from Georgia. I shot a few majors, but when I went to Georgia, everything was black. Yeah. You and make just, me laugh because you don't even care if it's black or blue. You just hate that it looks like shit and very unprofessional yeah. when it's black and blue. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You're like, I don't I care mean, if you put a hole in the barrel, just it looks ugly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can ask the setup crew. They got to the point where they were, if there's a bare piece of wood showing, they'd make fun of me. You want that painted over there? You know I do. <laughs> but you know, in that scenario. That actually is a good thing for for them as well because at the end of the day they might they don't know what squat stage they're really going to be on, but when they're on that stage, painting that wood is going to keep them from having an argument. Yeah, it's going to keep them from having to have a range master come over. It's going to keep you on schedule. It, it makes a big difference when everything's kind of ready to go and prepped and and it's just all taken care of before you get there as an RO or even as a shooter, because then there's no question. It's like, look, everybody's seen the same stage every single time over and over and over again here. And that makes a big, big difference. So it, it, it's a big, big thing. All right. Let's see. I think one of the, one of my next questions is, I think I asked you a double question here, but let's get into the cost. Hmm. what did this match cost overall to run? Well, let me, let me break it down a little bit. I have a couple of, let, let's do it a couple different. Cause I have okay. some, some more detailed questions than just what did it cost? Let's start with what was your overall cost that you actually spent on this match? Like out of, well, spent cash. And I don't want to get into a lot of numbers, but we spent $1 million. That's what you spent to run this match from top to bottom, just to have, obviously there's probably little incidentals, but you're actually really good about paperwork. So you probably actually have those numbers, you know, dialed in on the, on point. So yeah, for the most part, I, and I've got to for the club, because this is the club's money. We're making a little bit of money on this wait, wait, match. And you're not making a hundred thousand. You're not making 10, $15,000 on your oh, own. Please. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, you worked for eight months and didn't make 10 grand. I mean, what kind of dumbass are you? <laughs> I know, right? Tell me about it. I mean, honestly, if they were paying me my work hourly rate, we wouldn't, we'd be in the negative. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I really like that. I'm glad you said that number because I don't think people realize how much it costs to run a match. We all look at entry fees and go, oh man, it's this, it's that. So you know, but you don't realize, like, how much did you spend on just targets? Um, 3000 So you spent $3,000 just on targets. Yeah, So 3000 no, just on the targets. There's no staples. Well, targets and pacers, I targets shouldn't say. And pacers. But there's no sticks. There's no target stands that have to be built. There's no, there's no anything that that's just literally the thing that comes in the box that you have to hang still, right? There's no, no yep. that's all, that's all it is. Now you guys did waterproof targets, right? 
all yes, waterproof. Sir. So what was that decision? Where did that decision, like, did, are you, were you with a committee on this or did you pretty much make decisions on your own and then just ask a few questions to a couple of guys or? It's, I mean, the first year it was more of a committee asking some people. Right. This last year it was just, Hey, I'll spend the money on this. Let's go. Okay, cool. And I did get some questions on it, but that really came from that decision came from back in 2019, the club put on an IDPA match there and staff day was great. Rained all day shooters day. Oh. dealing with bags and yeah. they didn't have the waterproof targets then and then the president at that point um frank scalise and i were talking about the first match and we were like let's just go all waterproof it's going to be more money but we know he and i both he was the match director for that match i worked a stage on that match it's miserable so, so let me ask you a question about the bags in this match if we had rain at this match would you have finished on time because of the bags that really slows down a match. No, we won't have bags. It's waterproof. No, no. If you would not have chosen the 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 water. Oh no, we. It, there's no way you could do a half day format with bags. There's no way. So right then and there, that decision just took off stress right away. Right, yeah. like just made it so much easier for you. Right, like yeah. I mean, obviously you have a lot more shit than just bags. <laughs> yeah, but you got. But, and you've got that in the waterproof targets held up even better than what I thought they would, because I think it was stage two that staff left up the targets. And I was like, I was actually like, okay, I'm going to leave them and see if people shoot them. Nobody shot them, but I took some pictures. I might post them later just for DAA, but they were out for a week with holes in them, pacers and stuff. And you could still make up the lines on it and stuff. Stage four, when I came back a week later for my class was still up and it had been shot to shit. Like, cause a lot of those had hardcover and some yeah. of those have been shot to shit and that stage still looked really good. Like I was like, wow, dude, like these targets, like you can't use them like for a match because they, you can't see the perf anymore because that was the, that was the end of the Sunday that everybody had shot them. Yeah. But I was like, like during the class, we had to change them out, but I'm like, man, look at these targets, dude. Like these look good. I think there was only one target that actually looked bad and it looked like the, like almost like dirt or water had kind of gotten in between. I think at the top, it just yeah, ran it through and weird, did that but streak. It still was a good target, man. You didn't even have to yeah. take it off. Like it could have been, it could have still ran. It just, you could tell something kind of got between one of those layers. But yeah. it was still a saw. I mean, we actually, I think we ended up leaving it up and shooting it for the class. So we didn't have to use extra tar targets on that one. Yep. I mean, that was crazy. Like I, I was very impressed by those, those targets. I thought it really bothers me that we have this now and we don't make it a a mandatory thing. I don't want to say mandatory because again, here we go with the USPSA mandatory, mandatory, mandatory rule crap. But it, uh, when you have a match, charge a little extra. I guarantee yeah. you, if you just put a poll out <laughs> before your cost and said, "Hey guys, we want to raise the match by five dollars a shooter for targets," hello, sold. Like I guarantee you, dude, people will pay five or ten dollars more for the waterproof targets. Nobody wants to shoot in bags. It's miserable. And if you have a match that it possibly rains at, what the hell are we doing? Yeah, it was, and it's, those targets hold up better than their, your regular cardboard targets, even when it doesn't rain. They last longer and they look better. And some people are going to say, well, it's got the sheen on it. It doesn't have, it's not a, um, the flat brown. Yeah, deal with it. I'm not a big fan of, what they look like when you shoot them, like, because it's really hard to call the shot as a shooter. They don't like, they, they yeah. tend to go, the hole goes in and they tend to like almost fill out a little bit, but I'll do that over bags all day. <laughs> yeah. And there <laughs> was only because I'm not used to them, like, because they're somewhat new. We haven't shot them a whole lot, but it's no different than when I first started shooting USPSA and I'd never shot brown paper targets like that before. And I know you didn't see this, but we had some of the older ones that were left over from the last year. And then those were a little bit thicker and you could tell that it was the first formula. Their yeah. second formula wasn't near that bad. Oh, so they're better. So they've changed okay. up their formula. I could tell that between having their, the first year that I did the match and the second year, it wasn't as thick. So you could, it was still evident, but it wasn't as bad as the first year ones. Nice. So um, a question about targets, since we're on that, how many, uh, times did you have to change targets? Do you have a specific, all right, guys at lunch, we're changing, or did you give your guys permission to change them as needed or, or how did that work? Nah, for you? you don't ever, I'm, I hate to say this. You don't ever tell your ROs you can change as needed because your target budget will be 5,000 instead of 3,000. Right. 
So um, what we did do is I had six changes of targets for each stage set up. And then some of them, we, and I'll adjust this actually for next year, I'll talk about that a little bit, is we had six targets. So we shot a small squad on Thursday just to debunk the stages. And then staff day, we used the same um, set. And then on Saturday morning, they changed it out afternoon. And then for Sunday morning, they had a, a fresh set for the afternoon and there's a fresh set for Sunday morning. So there's four changes that we had accounted for right there. I had six for each. Um, some of the ones that we ran into were the slasher targets on the USBSA, where up in that corner, they would, that's a target zone. You're going to get an A or C in there. Yeah. That got shot to shit. <laughs> and so they're having to change it out more yeah. than expected right. because you couldn't see the perf zone in there. And yeah. that's something that I'll probably talk, I need to talk to the stage designers. If you're watching, we're doing verticals. We're not doing slashers. <laughs> <next year. laughs> yeah, because it's real. I mean, you you're, you lose your you lose the amount of A zone that you have. And yeah. it, it, it's almost like a headshot. Right. It's like you have 300 and something people shooting headshots into one zone or one target. You're going to have eventually you're going to have no A zone after the first 20 people. You know, I mean, that's 100 shots, yep. right? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, or 200 shots. So it's, it's, yeah. it gets to the point where it's too much. You're not going to be able to keep that target rolling, you know? Yeah. The registration guys, one of them stopped and got me paint Saturday night and they were making targets just in anticipation Sunday morning. I'm like, Okay, I need six or seven of these. I work with Aaron and Adrian, the right. guys. I'm like, okay, let's get these targets set out. And I was like, as you guys take targets out, you got to tell these two what you're doing so they can make more. Yeah. And we ended up still having extra, but I'd rather have extra than be painting them literally on the stage. So. I don't think you had that many extra, though, did you? Like uh, Of the slashers, no. Yeah, because I remember trying to get some for our class. <clears throat> I was yeah. trying to get some for the class and you didn't have them. And I was like, shit, like they were, they were, you know, you had other hardcover, but I was like, yeah, there's yeah. no more slashers, dude. Like, <laughs> so you were running it to the edge for sure. But yeah. um, I want to bring up somebody because uh, I think it's important. And I, I want you to send me a picture. I think you posted one already, but I want to talk about just Vinny and how much he busted his ass just painting those targets. Oh. How many, dude, I think you said you had like 200, 210. 210 hardcover targets that were painted by who? One Vin man? Yeah. And One Vinny's man. a great dude. He's on my <laughs> – Vincent Poti is his full name. Um, He's on my setup crew for my locals. He does setup – he does setup crew for three different matches around here. Um, for Spartanburg, awesome. they run two um, matches a month, and then he does mine. And he's just a great dude who loves to help the sport, doesn't ask for anything in return. Um, he wasn't able to come set up and he's like, I can't do this, but I've got a job where I've got access to a warehouse at after hours, bring me the targets and I'll paint them. I'm like, are you sure? I was like, you realize that's 210 targets, right? <laughs> you just <laughs> screwed yourself. <laughs> yeah. So I brought, I met him and we took him over to his work because not even all the targets have fit in his car. So I did, I met him at a spot. I was like, these targets aren't going to fit in there. So then I met, he followed him to his work and we dropped him off there. Awesome. He taped them and painted them. And on those, on the waterproof targets, he said it took three layers on some of them because you got to do a fine dusting. And I never thought of it, but he's like, you got to do a dusting, then it sticks. And then you got to do a coverage layer after that. So each target had like three coats of paint on it. It probably wouldn't be a bad idea to do primer on those type of targets because of the wax. Maybe do a primer first. Um, and like for those, yeah. then you could use the primer and then the black will go over that. But that we used to cry on like the primer and paint yeah. all in one, but it's yeah. no, that shit it, doesn't work. Trust me, dude, that, that, that double primer slash uh, <laughs> paint, all that is, is watered down paint. Yeah. Like, have well, you ever seen what primer looks like and what paint looks like? They're oh, too for viscosity. So when they say, Hey, primer in the paint, that just means they watered down your paint period. So they make a lot more money for that double gimmick that they they're giving you. So nothing beats old school sometimes with some of this stuff. Yeah, it make, does, but you know, it's, yeah, I don't even want to that's talk pretty about awesome, how much dude, the fact that you have a guy that's willing to paint 210 slashers. I hate doing 10 of them oh, I know. and he did 210 of them. So I figured, you know, I remember you telling me that story when I was there and he, cause he took a class, he was in the class with us. 
And I remember us talking a lot about like the match and all that kind of stuff. Cause obviously we were fresh off of it. We were running stages off of it. And I remember asking about the slashers and the, and all the things he's like, yeah, that guy right there just painted over all these shit. And I'm like, Oh my God. I said, what's wrong with you? And he just started laughing. He was like, yeah, I know that was kind of dumb. <laughs> like, yeah. But I even so asked him, I'm like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think people realize how many, 210 targets is <laughs> right. Like, no, it's... you know, 210 is a lot, but when you like lay out 210 targets, it's the size of a bay. Like it's, that's a yep. large amount of, of targets, right? I mean, that's a shit ton of targets. And then to have to detail every one of those is like, you have to put tape. Oh yeah. You and have there... to roll it. You have to paint it, spray it, then there was... move it and put a new one up. And it's crazy. There was even more than that because I had, I had it set out for him and I made a few mistakes, but that's neither here nor there, but I had it broken down to by bay. Here's what I need for stage one. And stage one had an obscene amount of hardcover. I think it had like six different hardcovers and what he did. And we talked about it. He, went through and he did stage one and he wrote one on the back of it and he That's put those awesome. in a specific box. So Aaron and Adrian as quartermaster and Mr. Fix it would be able to go just grab it out of that box and get those targets out. So you're not going through and everything. It's just that detail that you don't think about until you're doing. So and he did that awesome. for all 10 stages. Yeah. And that's awesome because that makes it so much easier for you, your staff, because that's the thing is, the prep is one thing, but if it's unorganized prep and you can't find anything, then what did you actually prep, right? All oh, you yeah. did was just throw a bunch of boxes in a room and now you're like, shit, where are, th oh, I left those at the shop. You know, I forgot those, that box is sitting over at the shop and the matches in the, <laughs> you're 45 minutes away from everything. Yep. So, and then, I yeah. Mean, and then you got to pay attention to the way your quartermaster and your Mr. Fix it organize some targets because you may or may not pull targets from the wrong area and then mess them up. <laughs> I don't know who would have done that. I don't know who would have done that. Those guys would never do that. Hey, man, it's hard to get uh, really good free help. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I was the one messing up on that one, not that, but yeah. <laughs> you gotta you gotta it's really hard to find free help these guys are just you know you can't pay them enough to get them to get their shit together uh let's see so that i talked about the food oh how did you get sponsors like that's a big that was a big conversation that we kind of came out of that match with duda with bill duda from go fast don't suck yeah so shout out to bill for supporting the sport supporting this match it was pretty awesome to actually have him come out and uh it looks like he's starting to come out he was at area six so it looks like he's going to start, he's starting to try to spread out a little bit, like, and, and become a sponsor a little bit more at a match. So that was really cool to have. Him well, that, yeah, his technology package that it brings together, that's, I'd seen him post something on it prior to that. And I sent him something. I, I was the first match that he committed to for 2022. And he, I, he had to drive, I don't know how many hours it was, but I don't know, seen amount of hours to get there and get everything set up. But it was awesome to have that in 22 versus 21 where we were doing the paper printer stuff and Belton has dust, as we all know, and uh, dust was messing up the printers and it was just a fiasco. Yeah. I mean, we were having stats at every stage for three or four times a day. So having him come do the wireless, talk about that, have the booth there be the sponsor support. And we'll talk a little bit about the sponsors in both years. At some point I want to talk about that, but talking to the sponsors and well, hell we'll do it now talking to him, talking to David um, with Da Vinci and um, Ray with the zero sports. And then the year before I want to throw out there, Brian Connolly with eight hunters, HD gold, the sponsors that actually go out to these matches, y'all support them because they know what's going on. They know what's going on in the sport. They know more than I do. And I mean, I'm not saying I know a lot, but these guys are the end all be all for the sport, Brian offered a lot of good feedback off of 2021. He's like, your major failure point is people don't know the range yet. He's like, you got to figure out a way to let them know the range. So we did a little bit more on that. We made sure we had more golf carts this next year based off of some feedback he, he gave us for that. Um, David and Da Vinci and then um, Ray and the Zero Sports and then um, Bill Duda with Go Fast Don't Suck. They were not critiquing, but offering points of improvement for the next years. And I appreciate that because if I don't know it and I don't get that feedback, I can't improve. 
So definitely support them, support what they do. Bill's done so much more in the sport than I realized. He says been making funny since 2019. Yeah, but he's also ran an area, I think, eight a couple of times. He's ran some other majors. He's been involved in the sponsorship relationships and all that. He's a wealth of knowledge, and people don't realize it. Hell, I didn't realize so, it. So I, I, had, I had no idea that he did all of that. Like, I, I just thought he had just kind of started this company uh, and and built what this. But again, I, I've only been in here for so long, only a couple of four years. Yeah. Uh, so I don't obviously I, I don't know the past of where a lot of these guys came from. But when you were telling me his like list of accomplishments in the sport, I was like, ah, this makes more sense on why he has a lot of. I don't want to say opinions because obviously he does. We all do, but he has a lot of knowledge on the things that he would like to see grow the sport. And he's come from an era when I would say it was golden era where people weren't selfish. They were more volunteer. They they yeah. wanted to jump in and help. They wanted to grow the sport. They want, they actually had prizes. We had gun company support. Uh, there was a lot of those things that have walked away and, I mean, I, again, it's a culture thing. And he's talked about this before on all his podcasts and, and all these live videos that he does and everything else. So it, I think it's something that they should listen to him a little bit. I, I was, I didn't realize how, like you said, the amount of knowledge that he helped you with was pretty awesome. Like he didn't have yeah. to give you that information. That was pretty damn cool. No, it was. And I mean, I've already had conversations with him about next year and Hey, we talked about this. I can do this better. Can you do this? And He's got a few um, R&D projects based off of our conversations he's going to do now. So, I mean, that's pretty awesome, man. The fact, because again, they don't have to do this, right? No. They don't have to come to your match. They don't have to help you try to make it better. But that says a lot about you. I know you don't like when I tell you how awesome you are, but that says a lot about you because you are open-minded to listen to what he said. You didn't just go, yeah, whatever, man, we got it. Thanks for your thanks for sponsor sponsoring the match or putting your name on the match. I mean, you genuinely want to make the match better. You're one of the few match directors I know that were brave enough to send out a um, survey. A survey, right? I mean, when I did that survey, I did nothing but talk shit. It was awesome. I was like, yes. <laughs> and the best part of it all was when I called you the next day. I was like, hey man, you know how's the survey going? You go, you go. This was your survey, wasn't it? I go, damn, you know me. <laughs> I mean, you know exactly what I said. You know exactly what it was. Like, you son of a bitch. And I was like, I was like, yeah, how are the surveys? And you're like, they're good, man. He's like, it's it's really good. He's like, I've had a few that were kind of just people bitching because they picked the wrong gun for a 32 mound stage match. <laughs> yeah. You know? And uh, and I think I I mean the first thing out of my mouth was people are gonna complain to complain. You know, oh, and it doesn't matter how good when I heard, I heard someone say that there's only one way to shoot these stages. I was like, you suck. Like, that's the first thing out of my mouth that I wanted to say was like, I have seen, I was shooting with a production shooter. Okay. I shot yeah. with a production shooter and there was four different viable plans that we worked on while we were walking stages together. We have Ray shot production, production, right? Shooter. Yes. Yeah. He's still crazy enough to shoot those iron. I am, right. And I told him, I was like, dude, this is, you can do it this way. You can do it that way. You can do it this way. And you can do it this way. And I remember watching other production guys come up and go, this is, there's only one way this, this stage sucks. I'm going to have a standing reload. I'm like, there was not a single standing reload here unless you wanted it. <laughs> right? Like I'm running the same stage as you are. And I know that you can run these different ways. It's just what they chose to do. Yep. So it just drives me crazy that instead of being productive with our, I guess I'll call it complaints, you know, constructive criticism is key. If you want to make something better, you have to give constructive criticism. So the fact that a match director gives you a key or a way of giving constructive criticism and the best you got is the stages sucked because I could only run them one way. Well, there was that, but that's, those are the one-offs. And I, yeah. I work in an industry where for part of my it's I've been customer facing for almost 20 years out of it. And one of the things we do is the MPS surveys. And it's basically a survey where I'm looking at them for the individual responses. Yes. But I'm also looking for patterns. Right. And I did a staff survey and I did a shooter survey. 
I probably would have got more responses, but the first links I sent out were dead links. I don't know what happened to it. Yeah. Changed. I literally just rebuilt them and sent out the correct links, and they worked. Well, you're sure. But I think sure. you don't know what you're doing. That's why you can't post the link. <laughs> I know, right? Anyway, <laughs> they worked before I sent it out. But anyway, <laughs> so I got. Eight... I, I, I'm not coming back next year because you don't know how to send a link. I mean, this is ridiculous. Yep. <laughs> I sent out. We got 88 responses on the shooter, and I think like 16 or 17 on the staff. And yeah, the porta potty stunk, and we're gonna look at getting different. I know, but it's a thing that I even noticed. We're gonna look at getting a different company for next year. Um, yeah, I- what with because I, I wanted to talk about the Wi-Fi thing. One really cool thing about your match was that you had live scoring going on after you shot. So as soon as you shot, your score was updated almost immediately. Mm-hmm. What does it take to do that? I'm interested in what you had to do to do do that. So you said well, I didn't do anything that? other than get Bill Duda would go fast, go don't suck there. Okay, so you, what did he do? He literally brought um he used his iPad manings, has a battery pack on the back of him. Um, he tapped into our Wi-Fi slash internet, which we're in the middle of nowhere, right. which sucks. But and then he took um some bi-directional Wi-Fi and some battery packs and set them up. I think he said he had four or five of them set up around the range. And so by having that range blanketed in Wi-Fi, whenever we did an update and we were able to publish it right away. So you were able to, for the most part. There was a few hiccups here and there where a battery would go down like a baked in. It went down a couple times. But other than that, you were able to get those scores and everything going on it. Yeah, it was pretty awesome to be able to shoot and instantly see your score against your competition. Like, that was really cool because there was no, oh, did I do well? Did I do bad? Yep. You know, how, where am I at? I didn't have to know what mine was or versus his. It was just instantly right there. It was really, really cool. I think there was only maybe one or two stages that, and I was getting kind of close to, we were, it was a real heated match for me. Like I was real close the whole time and I was getting scores really like almost instantly. So that was really cool because and I think maybe one or two stages, it lagged a little bit, but yeah. it was more or less because I didn't really refresh. I just kind of was like, all right, I'll, I'll look at it later. And then that's, it, so it really wasn't something that they did or you guys did. It was something that I just didn't really pay attention to. So, and when I updated, it was there right away. So it was really cool to see your scores come through um almost immediately it was it was really nice because you don't see that a lot at matches you really don't no and that's one thing that after talking to bill he's like you guys don't need to have me here for this part of it i want to come back and stuff but here's what you can do and i've actually talked to him since the match and we're going to get a few quotes in for it on how we can make it so all 10 of those bays are covered in wi-fi and not have to have somebody come in and do what he did so we're actually looking at that. I'm talking to some of our security guys and stuff like that to get that done and get some quotes. So that's pretty cool, dude. I mean, so, I mean, that's obviously you guys are pretty fortunate that the club is private, but you put the money back into the club. You know yeah. what I mean? There's a lot of clubs that are private, but don't put the money back in. They just squirrel the hell out of it and don't really try to improve the range, you know? So it's pretty cool. Well, that goes to the leadership. I mean, that, I've been a member of that club for four or five years now, and it was, that way beforehand and that's why we have the comp base that are all of that pays for itself and all the money it's a non-profit it should go back into it do we need a bank account yeah we've got one yeah. but we also make sure that we're spending money back into where it needs to go to in the shotgun rifle or pistol so yeah you guys definitely have one of the nicest ranges like shooting wise that i've been to the the clubhouse is obviously is outdated but again i don't care about the clubhouse it's no. just a room where tables and stuff i don't care about any of that crap so yep. like that's that's the thing like everyone talks about how great alabama is the, you know the 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 range over there and i was like where we have nationals i was like it's a nice range i was like but it's a great clubhouse it's no different than any other range i've been to they don't you know what i mean it's not like plush green grass everywhere when you when you're on the range it's, it's all it's it's kind of a mixed bag of clay and rocks and it's not really uh it's not like when you walk on you're like wow this is gorgeous it's just a range, right? The cool mm-hmm. part is, is when you walk up to the clubhouse and it's a couple million dollars in clubhouse, right? Like, okay, that's cool. But I don't shoot in the clubhouse, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm coming there to get my damn safety card and get out. That's the only reason I'm there. So it's just interesting when you sit down and, you know, everybody has a different opinion of what's important at a, at a range, right? I mean, you have guys that are really upset about porta potties. Like, and I'm not joking. This happened in a lot of matches. People think porta potties are a big, important thing. Uh, you have guys that, 
feel like the the bays are really important, which I'm that guy. I'd rather have a better match and not worry so much about how pretty the clubhouse is. I don't care about the clubhouse. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care what the entrance looks like. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to have a great match and have good shooting. You know, that's what I'm there for. I'll go to eat somewhere else if that's, it gives me a better match, right? Like, yeah. That's what, I mean, again, when you're putting on a match this size that you guys are doing, everything adds up to matter as the match, right? Everything yeah. matters. Like, cause it, cause it just accumulates into a bad match. Um, when you start to see those little things, they add up in shooters minds, which I understand that. I, I totally understand that because at the end of the day, you're there for the experience of the match not just to shoot, right? You're there because not everybody takes this sport as serious as I do. So when we're shooting, I'm like, look, I'm focused on shooting. I don't care about the stinky porta potty over there. It doesn't bother me at all, right? I want good ROs. I want friendly staff. I want to know that if something's going to go wrong, that the staff is going to be there to try to make the correct call and not just make the call and get me the hell off the stage. Mm -hmm. right? They're going to work hard to get the correct call. That's what I'm looking for when I go to a match, which says a lot about your staff because of all the shooting that happened. I don't think we had one single reshoot on our squad and we had a lot of activators. A lot of things could have went wrong. Yep. We didn't have a single reshoot on our stage. So that says on a lot about stage your Stage three on staff day, I think we had four or five reshoots and it was because we didn't have one of the cables tight enough. Yeah. Once we adjusted that, and it, there was never another reshoot on that. And it yeah. didn't happen the day before, but it did happen on that day. But once we fixed that, that was it. So was I the don't... Max Trap stage? Yeah. Yeah. No, not yeah. the Max Trap. trap. Jeez. <laughs> Turner. I How long have you been shooting? Yeah. I, dude, I, I, they're all a Max Trap when they fall forward or down or whatever. I just don't know. I just do it all. <laughs> so, um I'm trying to think what the last thing I had. There's only a couple of things that I had left. I mean, we do, we pretty much talked about everything that I had. Is there anything that you had specifically that you want? Oh, I got one. How long or are you starting already on the next year's match? Well, yeah, well, we've talked about it. I'm already working on it. Um, one of the things that was nice is we knew the dates that we were going to target for next year already. So I was able to talk to the sponsors that were there um, and to the staff that was there. We told them that this, we broke the news at the staff meeting that, hey, it's coming back to Belt and Gun Club. Here's the dates. We want you back. Let me know. Um, I've already got a bunch of commitments from that. Um, talked to the, some of the sponsors were there. They're definitely interested in coming back next year. So it was a huge thing. To be able to do that, we got stage design going, going to try to keep it within the materials and everything we have already to save a little bit more money and then just keep on trucking and make it bigger and better. I don't want to say bigger, but make it better because yeah, we went pretty big last bigger, year. Dude. <laughs> I know we went pretty big last year. You're going to go from that half day format real quick if you make it any better. Oh, I know. It was pretty Trust big. me, that Saturday afternoon, like I said, scared me. So, are you guys going to, um, are you going to focus more on traveling for the people that are like going up and down to those upper bays? Like, are you going to get more golf cart? Did you feel like you had pretty much enough staff I to do everything or no? The first year we had um, just two golf carts running all over. And I didn't think that was enough. I think four was a sweet spot yeah. that there wasn't a lot of delays. They were actually idle for, there'd be times that they'd oh be waiting gosh, over yes. 10 or six. So a lot, they waited a lot. Like those guys didn't have to drive a whole lot. Like they waited yeah. a lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just because you guys were so efficient that it was like they they would just take them, drop them off and then come back. And the other squad was just getting there by the time they brought them back already. So it was like, yep. And this really worked out well. And this year we had, that's one thing that we changed from 21 to 22 is we had radios for the golf cart drivers. We had radios for stats. We had every, if you were on staff and not on a bay, you had a radio. Yeah. And that helped out a lot too. So being able to communicate and, there were a few hiccups in 21 because of the amount that we had. And literally there, if you saw a golf cart, you knew they needed to go somewhere. You had to stop them. Yeah. So this year they had the radio. So, yeah. What did you, um, I, I, I have two questions left and they're both on the same subject. What was the number one? Well, I guess this is a multiple part question. What was the number one complaint from shooters on the match? Legitimate complaint. If porta potties was it, you can say that it's fine. <laughs> I mean, Porta potties was one of them. Um, dust at the range was one of them. And 
we and I've explained this before. We had a board member. Wait, wait, wait. Explain the dust though. Was it for just the road? That yeah, just over? the road. Okay, so the road going to the base, not when we were actually shooting. Not when you were shooting, no. Okay. But the roads around the base okay. and everything are. It's really dusty, and right. we use Crusher Run for all the roads for whatever reason. One of our ex boards thought it was the way. Um, he wanted to make sure yeah. X board. <laughs> yeah. And it's not because it does a ton of dust. So we're, we are looking at different ways on how we can put stuff on top of that asphalt millings and some other stuff. So it won't be as dusty, okay. but that costs a ton of money. So, yeah. so what about a water truck? We've talked about that, but as you know, we're 30 minutes from nowhere. Yeah, it's true. So, I mean, and we looked into it the first year and I don't remember the numbers, but they were pretty obscene. I got two quotes. I'm like, there's no way. What about a trailer? Cause they make trailers that are like water containers to where yeah. you can drive them. And, and, and I know the up kind of thing, the clock match um, did something. I don't know what they did. I wasn't out there last weekend. I was doing other stuff, but I'm going to have to talk to them because yeah. they had a small solution that I think they're going to do. And I need to find out if it works for them or not, but yeah. we're also looking at, doing road improvements at the club. It's just a ton of money. Yeah. It's and for sure. you got to get member and board approval for that. So, yeah. Um, what was the number one, uh, compl- what was the number one thing that they liked about the match? St- we're talking about shooters, not staffs, shooters. Shooters. Um, they like the staff reset. That's the number one thing. Yeah. Really? I mean, That's the every, thing. The number one thing in all yeah. the surveys was they all love the staff reset. And, <laughs> and I don't know who started it, but I know North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, they own that. Yeah. And that's only, and I know it's done in other places, but majority there in those three states. And it's something that just makes everything go so much more efficient. Yeah. I think it's very, dude, it really cleans up a lot of mistakes. It cleans up a lot of bad calls. I don't mean bad calls, but no early pasting. It cleans yeah. up a lot of, I don't want to say cheating because I don't think that's a massive thing, but you will see people, oops, I didn't know that he had a mic over there, but I pasted this anyway kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that that does happen. But the uh, what's the number one complaint from the ROs? Are you willing to share that with me? <laughs> um, there weren't a lot of them. I mean, the number one complaint, I think it goes with ROs and staff is there wasn't enough ice. Really? So we did make ice runs in the morning and the afternoon on Saturday and just the morning on Friday and Saturday. But Friday, Saturday afternoon, it did get a little hot and the ice just wasn't staying. Now, and was this during the match that you heard? During the match, or, yeah. So it wasn't on the survey? Huh? It wasn't on the survey complaint? No, it was on the survey. So. Oh, okay. So they complained about that too. Right? Yeah. The, like, so it was consistent for the two things. Yeah. What's their number one thing that they loved? Besides staff reset? No, no, like, yeah, because they didn't have staff reset as shooters, did they? Oh, you mean for staff? No, they didn't have staff reset. I think the staff, and it's something that I adjusted from, it's one of the complaints that I got from staff when I listened to them from 21 is that they wanted jerseys. Okay. They wanted the jerseys. They didn't. We gave them two shirts in 21, and they were like, we'd rather have a jersey we got to wash out in the hotel room and hang up rather than having to wear these cotton things all day. So. Um, Ray with Zero Sports came along and said, I'll give you jerseys. Yeah, he's awesome. <laughs> Not, and he came on as a sponsor and gave us jerseys. And then when I went over X amount, I paid for a discount in price for him. Yeah, Ray, Ray's awesome. He is definitely, anybody who's looking for jerseys in this sport, you definitely have to go check out Zero Sports. They are a family-owned oh, business. Yeah. You are going to talk to either him or his amazing wife. Uh, when you call and you are going to get customer service, that guy is amazing. I, I watched him in action at the Mississippi classic that I went to and I was able to sit down and kind of hang out. Cause I didn't really have, there wasn't a whole bunch of people there. I was there to hang out with Ray and you know, he, he was able to uh, hook me up with a sponsored spot there. And it was really cool because I was, I got to sit down and, and meet his wife and talk to her a bunch and met his son. His son is, uh, I love his little son. He's so cool. So damn smart, dude. It's so smart. So we're sitting there and we're having conversations and I'm watching him do business and people are coming up and asking him for orders and just the way they take care of their customers. Oh yeah. Right? The way they take care of their customers is big. Like they're it, it, he, and he makes such a great damn Jersey. Like they, it's like wearing like air 
Like I yep. can't explain how hot it was in Mississippi on day two that it, it felt like I wasn't even wearing the shirt. It, it just dries out so fast that Jersey that actually you're wearing one. They yeah. just make a great product and they stand by it. You know, any mistakes, anything, they take care of it. There's no, Oh, well you ordered wrong. I mean, the guy's just phenomenal. He's going to be, I hope his business grows like Hunter's HD gold in this business. I really do. Cause he's really a great guy. Yep. And, and he's, he's one of the ones guy. I definitely want back next for next year, because it's a great product. I've got him even um, coming up with designs for the club because yeah, the yeah, club has, even think about that. Yeah. The club has some jerseys that are for a specific sport, yeah. a shooting sport, not USPSA, yeah. but I'd like to see it be, more inclusive because the club's bigger than USPSA IDPA steel challenge. We're Absolutely. we have everything. We have shotgun, we have pistol, we have rifle. I want something that's going to include all that that I can wear out and be proud of, not just USPSA, because we're yeah. bigger than that. Yeah. Even you, though it's the number you, one sport, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Are you changing um anything about the sponsorship, like where those sponsors are going to be next year? Are you going to put them in front of the bays or are you going to kind of like Bill kind of oh. hung up at the top there? I know he decided to do that. Like, yeah. so he could be closer. I think he needed to be closer because of what he was doing with the uh, yeah. And I think stuff. there was stuff with that, and it's a high dust zone in there. And yeah. we talked about um, outside of one through three down in the comp base, they're wide enough that you could put them down in there also. And it's out of the dust zone and it's a high traffic area, too. I know Ray with zero sports, I think he hung out outside of eight because he thought it was a better area for him and the shooters. So we're, I mean, I'm open to whatever the vendors want to do. And I really ultimately get put it up to them. But up there at the clubhouse, it's a high dust zone unless we get that taken care of. And it's yeah. that's not fun for anybody. But that's where the food trucks are. That's where the registration is. So. so to me, I think that's a big thing in USBSA that I think needs to change. I noticed that. And I... I don't want to take credit for it because... But it happened last year at Area 6. When Area 6 happened... You were at Area 6. The the vendor tents were all way up top in 2021. They yeah. were way, way up top. Well, I brought Da Vinci's tent to Area 6. I drove. I brought their tent and uh, all the stuff that needed to be put up with me to the match that year. So I... <laughs> drove my happy ass down that down where it was this year in front of all the stands and where all the shooters yeah. were. We need to start thinking a lot about the visual in this sport when it oh, comes yeah. to sponsors. Jerseys and all those things are great, right? But you need hand this is a hands-on sport. You need to have your vendors, this is not you because you guys did, because you had a lot of vendors in front of the stages, but vendors need to be in front of the, the shooters, period, right? They need to be close to the shooters. Yes, it sucks to wear hearing protection or, or whatever you have to do while you're there, but we're at a gun range. So it's kind of like expected to have them with you. But we really need to make sure that these vendors get the eyes and the hands on their equipment when they're at these matches. So oh yeah. To me, it, a lot of things need to change with the sponsorship uh, thing. Like I have a, a buddy of mine and a student of mine who just took first place at, uh, for limited 10 at nationals this year in his classification. And I was asking him, I was like, Hey man, how, how was the, how was the award ceremony? How was that? And he goes, it was the shittiest award or prize table he had ever seen. He's like, it was the worst table he'd ever seen. And this is nationals, right? Like nationals. We're not, and this isn't a guy who won grandmaster, right? This is just a normal yeah. shooter. Like a guy who's working his way up, who's a student of mine, who's crushing it right now. Like obviously he's winning. So it's like, look, if that guy, your average guy <laughs> thinks it's shitty, who doesn't expect to win a gun when he goes, eh, I think you should start paying attention to the shooters a little bit on that. And, and I know it's not easy to get sponsors and to get oh, products. It's, it's not easy to get product. I get it. It's not an easy thing. I don't envy that job at all. I can't imagine for 400 shooters, you know what I mean? But again, where the hell's the money going? If we're a nonprofit, why isn't it being put back into the shooters? I, I just, I don't know. I just, it just kind of irritates me a little bit when I see the fact that we used to have prizes and now we don't have shit. You know what I mean? Like, even our trophies suck. <laughs> you know, well, your average trophy sucks because they don't want to, they don't want to spend the money. And I get it. 
you have to make money still in some aspects, you, you know, yeah. like they're supposed to be profitable, but it's it, it, nationals is getting more expensive and we're getting the same crap that we got when it was cheaper. I don't know. Well, yeah. <laughs> Nats, I can't speak to, I can speak to mine, but Nats, I definitely can't. So, yeah. well, I mean, your match, your match, you took care of your staff really well. I mean, you bought yeah, you outdoor bought. dynamics came on as a sponsor and what John and outdoor dynamics came on. What they wanted to do is they wanted to give two guns to staff. That's pretty awesome. So they gave the two guns to staff. Um, outside of that, CNC ammo and indoor range came on and they brought in four guns um, for the prize table. And then Da Vinci, at my request, came in with the full PCC competition ready to go. That was a badass gun. I know you've got one of them. And I might I've shot know yours. Who has one of those. <laughs> huh? I might know someone who has one of those. <laughs> yeah. I've shot yours and, um, that one that they brought the trigger and i mean every, i know they're up there but that gun you literally don't have to do shit to and you can go well what's good about him though man and and the vinci in general one it runs because he makes all of it he makes the upper yeah. and the lower and they match right like he makes yep. it in-house it's not something he buys or or has you know at a, a factory somewhere else he literally is the designer of that firearm a lot of the things that are on that firearm is because of me. Like I, like he was so open-minded when I first started shooting with him that he was like, man, here, take this, tell me what you hate. And I was like, this, 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 and this, he changed all of it, completely redesigned it. So it was a competition rifle and it just, it rips the, the crazy part is, is you don't have to buy someone else's parts. He will put in the parts that you want. Just tell him what you want. Like you oh, don't yeah. have to go, Oh, I'm going to pay for this ridiculously priced rifle or this rifle. And then I'm going to buy the trigger, the, this, the, this, the, this, he'll get yeah. it all to you already running, already make sure it's working. Everything's put in correctly. It's from, he's basically the manufacturer at that point, right? Yeah, he's got the different that buffers that he'll put in the different triggers that he puts in the different pumps. It's, yeah. it's amazing of all the different stuff that he'll put into that gun, the different mag wells. And I'm not a PCC guy, and I know this just by talking to him. Yeah, it's he's definitely wants you to be happy with the rifle. That's that's definitely never an issue. He's going to make sure that you get the rifle the way you want it. Because at the end of the day, I mean, what the hell are you doing this for as a as a business in general? You're doing it to make customers happy. Yeah. You know, you're doing it to make customers happy, and that's what it's all about. Like, you know, again, if you to say uh, there's only one way to do this, it's not true. You can put that rifle together with many different parts and still make it work. To me. The most important part of that rifle is the upper and lower that they match and they work together. So basically all the other stuff is just putting parts in. But if you don't have an upper and a lower that work together, you don't have a gun. You don't have a rifle that works anyway. Yeah. And I think at area six, he gave away four uppers and lowers for that That's match. Awesome. And it was because of that, because you could then put in whatever you wanted yep. and have a still a great gun. That's different parts. Yeah. I'm a big fan, man. I've I've been shooting them for three years. I haven't shot PCC in a while, but I've been shooting them for I have I've been shooting that specific gun for three years. And I probably have close to 50, 60,000 rounds out of it. And I maybe have three jams out of it. And it's only because I probably got a powder puff in there somewhere. Like it was usually because it, PCC, most of your jams are are ammo related. Yeah. Right. Whether it didn't feed properly, which becomes the magazine. Or you don't have uh, enough juice to get that gun to, to let it out the next one, you know? Yeah, and one of the awesome things that talking to him when I was talking to him, met him at Area 6 is they have backup guns there at the table. If I was shooting a PCC I put together myself and it jammed up and I can't finish the day, go talk to him and set it up with him. He'll let you shoot one of theirs at the match. It doesn't have to be theirs. Yeah. And that's another thing that Brian with Hunter's HD Gold, if he's at that match, he's got backup guns for you shoot. These are guys that support us, so we got to support them. But it's just the awesome stuff that out that's out there about that. Yeah. So you know who Christina Baker is? Yeah. Met her a couple so, times. Yeah. So she was at the match, and we were I was laughing my ass off because she started shooting. Well, you know, we, she started shooting for Da Vinci, and uh, yep. I guess one of her guns broke because I guess she's had a lot of problems with PCC. And she borrowed a gun from Brian. Well, Brian has a Da Vinci. She didn't take the Da Vinci. <laughs> so that was before, like before she was sponsored. Yeah. So she picks up the other brand and it fucking broke in the same match that hers broke. 
And yeah. then after that, she tried to Da Vinci and she's like, I should have taken the damn Da Vinci. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, that's just shit luck, right? Like you have two yep. guns. The other one I think has a lot of like cuts and stuff in it. So it's a little prettier. Oh. I'm but pretty sure I know who you're talking. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. The more holes you have in that rifle tends to be the more shit that can stick out and get jammed up. So just saying. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Da Vinci. That's a really good rifle. Um, I like that he's really sponsoring a lot of matches now. That's really cool that he's really growing the business and, and uh, pushing towards the sport more. I really like that. I think that's cool because a lot of manufacturers are going away from the sport. Yep. So, And he's even making some, I think, Primer machines and some other stuff too. Yeah, that he's, he's got a decapping machine that he yep, that he uh, brings in and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, he's he's got his hands in a little bit of everything when it comes to the sport. So it's kind of it's pretty cool, man. Yeah, but, I've uh, got yeah. family down in that area, as you know. And when I come down there, that's one of the people I want to go see. He's like, "Come on in, I want to give you a tour." I'm like, "I absolutely want a tour." So yeah, it's welcome. on my list. It's really cool that the uh, he makes limited grips for limited guns. He makes yeah. a lot of things that. Um, yeah, he has some really cool ideas. Like, I don't talk about him a whole lot because until he sells them, I don't say anything. But he's got some really cool limited um, grip ideas and different ways of doing frames. And it's really kind of neat because it's it solves some of the problem you have with 2011s for sure. There's a little more meat to hold the gun. Uh, not even the thumb rest, but there's a little more meat to where you can put your gun, up, your finger up on that like where the slide would be crushing your hand, you'd be crushing mm -hmm. the slide with your finger and stopping the slide. There's, he's got some pretty cool ideas, but uh, the other thing that he makes that I, I don't, I haven't talked about this in a long time, just because I haven't really, no one really asked, but he makes an amazing comp. Like his comp for PCC actually works. Like I know a lot of guys like those super lightweight, like long comps where there's, you know, it's, it's like a five inch barrel, but a 16 inch shroud kind of feeling, yep. but he, he makes some, some really good comps, like the actual work, the way he's designed them. And I won't give too much out about it, but the way he designs them and the way he's cut them so that the air goes a specific way, it really works. It, it really works. So it's, um, it was the first thing that I fell in love with his gun about was the accuracy. Like the damn thing just sits in the same spot the whole time. Well, did you see the video of Jared Clayton that actually won it? No. He was running a plate rack with no sights <laughs> in three seconds. Nice. With that gun. I mean, no red dot, no sights, no yeah. nothing. Out of the box, yeah. running a plate rack in three seconds. Well, and that's the thing that's so great about that pit, that rifle is you don't need to modify it, right? I mean, no. well, you don't need to modify it to any other reason than what you want in it. But when you have a trigger that he puts in it because that's what you wanted in the first place, guess what? You've already modified it to what you like. Uh, yep. he'll, he'll recommend things from just his based off his experience of what we buy and what we like, those kind of things. I've had people call him up and order a gun and said, I want whatever Tom had in his gun. And he sets it up exactly the way mine is because they've tried mine. And they're like, I love yep. the way that felt. I'm like, all right, here you go. The, the difference in my setup and most people though, is my guns kind of heavy compared to most. Mo I, I, I'm not into the super lightweight gun. Uh, I, you know, I don't care about any of that, even though I shoot a plastic, fantastic canic. Um, you know, in pistol, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't usually go after the lightest transition gun anyway, because, uh, you just need to move the gun, right? Work out <laughs> something. <laughs> so that's just kind of where I'm at with it. But yeah, man, he's, um, it's really cool to see that you got him as a main <coughs> sponsor for your, for your match. That was really, really cool. Yeah. Well, you helped me out with that in conversations, but yeah, yeah. definitely. He was a good guy to have, and it's a good relationship that I hope we have for years going forward. So. As long yeah, as I'm doing well, it. Well, I'm glad I was able to hook you up with him, dude, because he's, uh, you know, he he's he's good for the sport. You know, I mean, he's been actually doing a lot of, he's been doing a lot lately. I noticed he's in New Mexico. I think he just went up to like Pennsylvania area and did a match, a sectional match up there. He's been traveling around quite a bit and uh, kind of pushing the pushing the pushing the business a little bit towards USPSA, which is honestly, I think it's yep. amazing because he makes a great damn product. And it, you know, again, the number one thing with a PCC is you need it to run. <laughs> well, that's any gun, but yeah. Well, yes. But with PCC, especially man, because you can get a gun to run for most of the time. And it only takes a few times for that jam, jam o -matic to happen. Right. Like, it's just the way it is. But with a PCC, it's just, it's very difficult sometimes to get them to run because 
most people love for whatever reason, they just never got over the Legos thing and just love building guns, which is great. But when you're building multiple manufacturers and jamming all that stuff together, it doesn't always work. You know, it just, it doesn't yeah. work, but so it is. What Let's, it is. Yeah. We turned it into the Vinci post. <laughs> What's that? We turned this into the <laughs> Vinci podcast. Well, I mean, no, not really. I mean, but listen, I, I know. Mean, you know, when you have a good relationship with somebody and they make a great product, uh, I hope that other people get a chance to try it. I mean, even if, like you said, you know, go to Hunter's HD Gold, talk to him when you're at the match and say, hey, man, can I check out the, the Da Vinci? He has no problem letting you take it to a bay and shoot it. They have no problem at Da Vinci letting you try it. Uh, Craig brings it to every match, be, you know, because that's what he yep. shoots. Uh, you know, they, they have no problem letting you try it. That's the, you, you have to believe in your products for them to, to work. Right. I mean, and they believe in it so much that they bring them to let you try them or even shoot a match with them. That That's just kind of what they're, that's pretty awesome. Cause most gun manufacturers don't go here, try my gun and use it for the match. That's not how it works for most. Yep. So, I know dude that had one of his guns that he was trying to get people to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, um, he's a good, he's great for the sport too, man. Like he's very big for the sport. I, I actually, we sat down and had dinner at the end of the, of the end of the match there that poor guy sat down and listened to us kind of talk it up and everything else. And it was just, it was really cool to listen to him kind of his, this, his experience in this sport is really cool. Like I think more people should pay attention to, like I started paying a lot more attention to what he said because of his experience. I didn't realize the amount of experience he, he's talking from, right. I mean, oh, yeah. You have a lot of guys talking out of their ass. I never thought he was that guy. But it was like, oh, man, like you actually hit, ran some shit like and have been in this stuff for a while. I didn't realize that he was in it this long. Yep. And even after South Carolina, he's done a few match director. How can we improve? How can we do this? And I've, I've listened to all those and talked to him about stuff that came up on those. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, dude, it's it's like there's specific guys in the sport that are trying to grow things, uh, you know, and it's, those are the guys that should have their, the loudest voices for sure. We, we need more of the let's grow instead of let's go backwards attitude. You know, I think it's, and I don't mean like, let's just bring in a million people, but I'm saying is that there's a lot of things in this sport that we can make better that we already have, right. Without having to get any bigger, without having any rule changes, we just need to do things that makes sense for everyone, not just for the match director, not just for the, the, the sponsor, not just for the shooter. We can all work together, but we all have to learn that there's going to be some sacrifices in and out of there, right? Yeah. Like, there's going to be some sacrifices here and there, and that's just how it works. But, you know, it, that's the hardest part, I think, man, is learning those sacrifices, right, and what we have to do. So if you want better prizes, <laughs> you want better prizes, you have to go support those sponsors. Oh, right? yeah. You want, you want, more, you want waterproof targets. You might have to pay a little bit more at the match. Uh, you, you know, you want your, you want staff reset, volunteer your ass to staff reset, right? Like oh, you yeah. want staff reset. So one year do staff reset for your, for a help the next year, somebody else does it. And then you can take the next year off. That That's the problem with it. Mostly though, is you see the same people always volunteering. Oh, you do. And I saw it. At like Georgia and Area Six in my match, you see a core group of individuals that doing them. Hats off to them. Yeah. And Donna and I even talked about this: is we want to work more matches, but while we're match directors, yeah, it's just I don't have the time to do everything. I want to be a good shooter too. And yeah. somebody tells me I don't spend enough time on that. So damn right, I do. I say it, me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the thing, man. I just like that's important to. That's important for people to realize is this is a volunteer sport. And until we get paid, it's always going to be a volunteer sport. And I don't see us getting paid anytime soon. So at the end no. of the day, if you aren't going to help and you aren't going to run a match, you're not going to volunteer to set up stages. You're not going to volunteer to tear down stages. The, all those things, then shut up, period. Just shut the fuck up. Like, I, it gets so frustrating to me. See, you got me cussing now. It gets me. I so didn't do anything. <laughs> it gets so frustrating to me to hear all the complainers, but they don't volunteer. Right. It, it's just, it drives me crazy. It's like, look, put some time forth, right? Like put some, go help somebody. Like I, I know a couple guys that are in your area that run matches that do it all by themselves. And then, oh, you, go, oh, you know, you know, this match, this had this, or this didn't have enough of this or didn't have, I don't see you out here helping. You can absolutely slap your flavor on this match. If you want, if you want to do a production match, 
baby, let me know. And I'll give you the keys to get access to this place. But most people don't do that. They just complain okay. and complain and complain. I mean, I've got the same group of four guys that help me out with everything and that's it. Yep. I can't. Yeah. It's the same thing here, man. And, and that's one of the things that I talked to you about the other day where you need to start delegating some of those match duties. And I don't mean like, Hey, you know, can you help me this month or what? I mean, every month, somebody else should be a match director, right? Well, Obviously you're not going to have that every month, yeah. but you should not 12 months out of the year have 12 matches all on you. There should be an opportunity for someone else to step up and learn from you. Like Lucky's a good example. He helped you get to where you're at, yep. right? Duda is helping you get where you're at, but he's not your local guy. Lucky is, right? So Lucky took over, had you help. Now, if you need help, you can go to Lucky and say, hey, man, I need some advice or I need this or I need that. But now it's not like, hey, screw you, Todd, it's all on you, right? Now it's a team thing to where more people oh, yeah. can help do it. And that's what it needs to become more of. And I think in this sport is you don't need to take the entire responsibility on by yourself. And that's the problem is you get burnt out from running every match by yourself and doing all the work. And you can't do that. Yep. Obviously you're not setting up all the stages by yourself. I don't mean by yourself in that aspect, no. but at the end of the day, you're the guy that has the key. You're the guy that opens the gate. You're the guy that closes the gate, make sure everything's put away. So all that responsibility falls on you. If somebody leaves a bunch of shit out on the bay, guess who's not getting yelled at? them <laughs> right? yeah it's me yeah you're getting yelled at for for something that you didn't actually do you just forgot to babysit and follow up with somebody yeah so, and well and it's getting there i mean i've only been doing locals for monthly locals i want to say for a year a yeah. little over a year it used to be the fifth weekend of the month is when they did them when it first started out so we started doing the monthly ones about a year ago right. so it's definitely getting there and we got people that will do that. And I'm trying to get it done for a month specifically. We'll see if it happens or not, but it's a great thing to grow. And I, you got to volunteer. You, like you said, you got to put in the time to help out. I mean, I put in the time and I helped out a lot in IDPA before I moved over to USPSA and I put in the time here. Well, definitely putting in the time here. So, yeah. Dude, I think we have 17 text messages from our group. <laughs> oh, I know. I've been looking at it. I've been paying attention. I'm like, it's all about the match on yeah. Saturday, too. Uh, okay, I haven't been paying attention, so I'm like, oh, my God. I just happened to pick up my phone. All right, so what Todd was just talking about, I need someone to cover Todd's. Oh, geez. <laughs> June 25th and 26th. Well, your match is the 20. So 24th and 25th. I need somebody to cover Todd's ass so he doesn't have to be there for that match because he's supposed to be here with me training and doing a match. So again, anybody in Belton, South Carolina, or anyone anywhere near that area, if you would like to run the match in South Carolina, I would really appreciate it. And it's going to be on June 24th and 25th. Thank you so much ahead of time. Cause I'm sure you're going to have so many messages after this. Oh yeah. I want to sign up for that match to make sure that you can leave and not have to be responsible for one match of a, of the year. <laughs> we'll see. You think that worked? Probably. Not. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. They're like, fuck, oh, they're, they're going to be like, forget that Tom guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. All right, man. Well, I'm really glad you came on, dude. I, I really think that there was a lot of information that you gave. I actually was really surprised. I had so many questions that we just kind of went over. I didn't even ask, like we just went over them. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. But I'm glad you came on, man, because I think there was a lot of valuable information in exactly what it costs to run a, a level two match. But before we go, how many shooters did you have staff um, and, and paid shooters to do for this match? Do you have that number? 267. So 267 people came through that match that had to be financially taken care of at some point. Yep. Right. So you had to cover pasters, targets, food, had the food there, all those things. There's always a cost to all of that stuff. So that's pretty crazy, man. Almost 300 people. That's national level size right there. What, what did I, what would they have at area six? Pretty close to that same thing. Almost 300. Uh, I want to say they probably had closer to 350, 400, but they had, I think they ran all days. They ran different formats instead. They ran the half day there and the full day. Yeah. They ran half on two different days. So they, they played with the format a little bit to get more people in where we're just doing straight half day. And 
I didn't want to do last year when we did half day on Sunday afternoon. It was just a nightmare to tear down. Not many people signed up for Sunday afternoon. And I noticed Georgia didn't do it, so I felt comfortable not doing it. Yeah. It took off on probably a few shooters that would have shot it, but it allowed us to tear down, put stuff up, not have to worry about it on a Monday, and it let the staff, because some of the staff I didn't realize it until last year, drive three to four hours to work this match. Yeah. And if they're driving home at 6 o'clock at night, they're leaving. Yeah. They get home at 10, and they're pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. I didn't even think about that either. That's a good thing that you close that down early as possible. So after getting some of that feedback from 21, I was just like, we didn't have enough shooters to make it worth the while. So why do it? So since this is the, the end of the podcast here, we're going to end it really, really quick here. Let's talk about, before we get off here, how long did it take to break down this match after? So now everyone's shot, <laughs> everyone's scores are in. How long did it take to break down that match? So the staff did a great job of breaking down the stages themselves, but there's 10 piles of stuff that got to be put up now. So, and this was one of my deficiencies where I never planned for this and I'll be doing it better for next year, but you, um, Donovan Stettler, Ryan Flowers, Sarah Flowers, Stacy Flowers, um, David Hartley, Edward Anderson, and I took about probably three hours of running my truck in the trailer around the range to get everything back to the comics. That poor truck, by the way. <laughs> oh, that truck. It's a black truck that was great. It was trashed from the road. Oh, we that's the worst I've ever seen dust. that truck. We had to keep going up the dusty road to get all that shit up there at the top. And I was just like, I remember getting in, I'm going, damn, whose truck is this? This thing's all fucked up. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, I had, and I generally, We'll clean out my truck every time I go home and stuff oh, like you that. Lived in that truck, dude. It was oh, I mean, I had stuff piled up to the top almost in all the seats. It was bad. So I I didn't know that was your truck, right? I mean, I yeah. didn't know that was I didn't realize that was your truck because we drove up that for that match. Um, so I didn't even realize that was your truck. So I I'm at the match or no, I did I fly for that match? I can't what the you hell flew in. Oh, yeah, I flew. Sam picked me up. So I drove in Sam's truck the whole time we were there. I never even saw realize it was your truck. So we're sitting there and I'm, uh, I'm like, I'm driving this truck and I'm like, damn, dude, this thing's so dirty. Like it's like dusty everywhere. And I turn around and look in the back of like the pickup truck when I was emptying the stuff, I'm going, what is all this trash? Like there was broken wood and all this stuff. And then I realized they were like, yeah, this is Todd's. I go, this is the match director's truck. This makes sense. Uh -huh. There's, There's shit, shit everywhere. everywhere. There's broken shit everywhere from all the broken <laughs> sticks and steel challenge sticks. And I was like, this is the match director's truck. I mean, it wasn't full, full, but there was enough in there that I was like, someone's going to the dump after this. Like there was a lot of stuff. Yeah. There. Luckily we have areas to yeah. dump that stuff, but yeah, yeah. It, was, it was hilarious. So, but yeah, man, it was, uh, you know, I, I didn't care that I got credit for tearing down the stages, but it was something that I think people don't realize when you're done with the match, it's not done, no. right? It all has to be put away. It all has to go in its proper place. You, there's not, it's very rare that you go to a match and they're allowed to leave the stages up. Um, I know our range that I shoot at Guncraft, we have to tear the stages down every Sunday, every Sunday. Yeah, we, we have no choice. We tear them down and put them up. I don't have the choice at my local matches because yeah. Steel Challenge, Randy is there sending it, literally setting up the Steel Challenge stages as we're tearing down the USPSA and putting it up. Oh, really? So Yeah, because... What, do they shoot Sunday? Yeah, we, uh, we shoot the fourth Saturday, and they shoot the fourth Sunday. Uh, okay. So, literally, Randy shoots the match. He's on my setup crew. He's one of my four. <laughs> He'll help me set up this match, shoot the match, help us... Well, he doesn't... He'll help tear down, right. and then he goes and starts setting his stuff up. We'll put it all up, and if he's still working, we'll go help him. Yeah. The good thing about Steel Challenge is it's the same shit every single yeah. time. If you want to see a Steel Challenge match director freak out, go take one of those wicked things out of the ground. Do you remember? Do you remember when I said, "Hey, there's all these trash things sticking out of the ground"? You were like, "Dude, if you want to geek dead, then you just go ahead and start pulling those out." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like I knew what they were because they. Oh, were I know you did, but yeah, matches. But I was dying laughing. I was like, "Ooh, if I just start pulling all these things out, you think the Steel Challenge guys will get pissed?" <laughs> oh, Randy will kill us. But yeah. <laughs> well, I mean that the thing that's cool is you with your Steel Challenge. I noticed that. It's very organized there. You have a steel challenge thing, oh. but they cut the sticks to specific heights, knowing they've lasered everything. They know what Randy lays so Randy's really cool. went out there laser stuff. He knows what stick yeah. goes where. So 
Yeah, it's really cool. all up to spec. Randy was uh elevator engineer in his past life. Oh, so God. he is very, <laughs> very, very he's my classifier guy. Yeah. He's That's he was a perfect person for Steel <laughs> Challenge he's because they're all up to spec. I think that's hilarious that he's my classifier guy. That's awesome. He's he's measuring everything to the 16th of an inch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right, Todd, thank you for coming on, man. I had a great time. Uh, it's always great to see you. And uh, I'm sure when we get off here, I will be on the text message with you after this anyway. So <laughs> oh, yeah, we got to catch up. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, all right, guys. If you have any questions, hit me up in those comments. If you're looking for training, check out the Tom Castro Shooting Academy. I have an online course. I am also have some classes planned and ready to go this year. I have a Texas class in August, and I actually I have one spot left in Illinois coming up here in June next month. I think it's the 11th that I have my um, uh, training class coming up, and then I am going to be going to a bunch of major matches this year. So if you see me and we haven't met, Introduce yourself. I'll, I would love to meet you guys, and I'll see you on the range.